spent a lot of time uh, collating the questions that you all submitted, which were fantastic. And uh, you know, I said I was not going to do slides, but I decided last minute to pull some slides together just so I can remember what all the questions. I promise there's no there's no sales pitch here. I wanted to just get all the questions together um, because there were definitely some patterns in the questions that came up. So uh, I'm excited to dive in here with you all. Ashley, welcome from the UK. Good to see everyone. Well, let's you know look. Let's make the most of our time here today, and let's kick it off. So first of all. Uh, the, the first thing I want to say, I mean, this is a, a real big treat for me. You know, I hope, I hope you can kind of feel that as we kind of get into the session today and, and certainly by the end. But I just wanted to start out by thanking all of you. You know, this, this experience of writing a book has uh, been a dream come true. Just to be able to connect with people, honestly, all over the world and people reach out and they, they tell me how the book has impacted them and the, and the thoughts and experiences. And that for me is, is the best right? You know, I, I didn't write the book as a massive money-making proposition. It's just to get the word out there. This idea of, you know, we talk about in the book, this idea of people don't buy, you know, I'm going to paraphrase Simon Sinek. They don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it and your mission. And, you know, as you probably saw in the book, like I love sales so much, you know, we all got into sales by accident. I was no different, but I love sales and sales has given me you know, so much, um, so much goodness in my life. And it still to this day, though, bothers me that when you tell someone you're in sales, you are not their most favorite person, you know, you're, you're kind of the enemy, you know, it's like the way I describe you're like, there's sales, emergency room doctor, you know, maybe a little bit higher. But my hope is that over the course of time, we can kind of change that and bring sales back to the, to the luster that it so richly deserves. So really just want to thank you, first of all, for picking up the book for reading it, for, and for joining this, you know, like I always say, like it's it's one thing to to want um, to to be able to change and incorporate new tactics and philosophies and principles. It's another thing to actually make the time, make the investment, step into the gym. So I sincerely appreciate the time you're spending with me today, and I hope it is worthwhile. What I want to do, just to kick off, uh, I want to to talk about some of the top questions because as I curated again, there was over a hundred people who signed up for the book club. Uh, the top questions that I got. And by all means, so what I what I thought I would do is I would go through some of these top questions and uh, and then just open it up for people to ask. Uh, but by all means, these were the questions that that came up um, most often. And and I would say the number one question that came up was just about the pandemic, right? Like what has changed in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the world of sales, like what has changed in terms of buying, selling? What are you seeing out there? Number one question. The second question was about value and ROI. And I love talking about this, as you saw in the book, this idea of like value and ROI are not the same thing. And customers buy things because of their, you know, intrinsic and often hidden feelings. And so the question though, there was like a secondary question, like, hey, can you talk a little bit more about that? But then also talking about, well, how do we get customers to open up? Like, how do we get customers to open up about their feelings? And we talk about that in the book, in terms of the science of self-disclosure, but I've had some epiphanies even over the last week, and I, I wanna hit those as well. Then someone, there was actually a couple of people that said, you know, out of all the tactics that you've you've seen and taught and learned about, like what's the most impactful? Like if you had to pick a favorite one, what, what is that? And so we'll talk about that, that a little bit as well. Um, as well, you know, what's the biggest need that I see with my clients? I mean, the, the book writing for me, like that's not my, primary business, although it's it's a huge focus for me is the book and the content. Um, I train sales teams at companies. That's my primary business. And so the question came up over and over of like, well, so what do you see as the biggest need when you work with clients? So I'll answer that. Um, there was also actually quite a number of people who asked, you know, how do I convert an old school seller and not an, not an old seller by age, but just someone who's set in their ways. You know, a lot of people, they read the book and they say like, these are really good tactics. Like, but I have people at my company who are maybe a little bit slower to adapt or adopt these things. Uh, how do I get people who are rooted in a specific mindset, old school way of doing things to, to, to kind of turn the turn over to these tactics? And then finally people said, you know, hey, look, this is all great. Where do I start? Like, where should I start in terms of putting these tactics to work? So these are the things, these are the questions. Again, there was actually a tons more. I have another slide at the end if needed with, you know, dozens of other questions that people submitted that were fantastic. But these were the top things that people asked. So let's hit it. First and foremost, let's talk about the pandemic for a second. How has it changed 
buying and sales behaviors. And, and the, the thing I think about when I think about the pandemic is that it's a continuum. Like the stuff that was true and existed back a year ago may not be as true as it was today. And you actually see this in advertising. You know, when you, let's say, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, you start watching TV and you see the, the TV commercials and you're thinking to themselves, now these commercials were typically shot before the pandemic. And so they were running and you're thinking to yourself, is this company tone deaf? Do they not know what the hell is going on in the world today? Like it's like they, we shot these commercials, so now we have to run them. And then it kind of quickly pivoted to the, the like the, we're all in this together messaging, like with the soft piano, you know, like, oh, we're all in this together. Like, you know, cause people were scared. They didn't know what to do. And then very shortly after that, it started to, to pivot to, okay, this is kind of going to be here for a while. Now we kind of, you know, need to moderate our message and figure out like who we can help, what they care about. And what was interesting was that certain brands and companies who didn't pivot quickly enough to that message seemed tone deaf, right? And so you would have a lot of salespeople who would reach out to clients at the beginning of the pandemic, almost as though nothing was happening, right? Like their managers and leaders were saying, you know, got to keep making that you're working from home, keep making the calls. And that people were very, very distracted. And so there's definitely been a continuum. So this particular article, which I wrote, and for those of you joining, welcome, give a shout out in the chat, uh, just letting know, uh, letting people know where you're from. I always love to know where people are from. Um, and, and this is an article, I promise no slides, but then, then I thought, oh my gosh, like, how am I going to stay on track with all the, all this content? So I threw slides up. So this is an article I wrote at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was all about selling during adversity. And, and again, this was a very kind of, uh, initial pandemic mindset for me where I was saying, okay, hey, look, it's the beginning of the pandemic. Everything is going to shit in, in different ways in the world. And so as a salesperson, the first thing you need to do is you need to figure out like, okay, who am I going to sell to now, right? Because for example, if you were serving the hospitality industry or the restaurant industry, all of a sudden you found that your customers were not as interested in talking to you anymore, right? And so this, and, and then let's say, for example, you were in a kind of a more stratified uh, space, like you were in accounting, right? Or you offered cloud services to, you know, to companies and you served, you know, hospitality, you know, technology, uh, you serviced uh, um, uh, travel and transportation, um, you, you know, all these different companies certain sections of those companies are companies that you could no longer service. So my first message was don't spend time focusing on companies that are regrouping, that are, uh, that are never going to buy anything, at least in the near term, because you can't help them right now. They're not interested in your help. So I said, you know, personalize and prioritize, refocus your target account list based on companies that you could help. And this is something that, by the way, at Salesforce, we did all the time. And I know there's probably a bunch of ex Salesforce people or Salesforce people on this call. So you know this, we would always tier our accounts and figure out who were the clients that we could help the most. And every quarter we would go through that process. And so a lot of companies needed to do this on a much more frequent basis. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, you know, knowing that people are, you know, just distracted and they have so much going on, invoke the, the concept I talk about in the book of reactants, right? Which is make it okay for them to say no. Like, now's not a good time. You got other things you got to focus on. It's okay. Like, tell me no, right? The idea was that in, during times of adversity, it would be more likely for someone to say yes, if you made it okay for them to kind of walk away. And then of course, acknowledge and empathize. And this, you know, I felt was actually, this should have been easier than it was given that everyone was working from home and they have like, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing training, I'm training people from home. And, and they're at home and they have like babies on their lap and cats jumping on the camera. And that should have been, you know, easier for us to acknowledge and empathize, you know, hey, look, we're all in this, in the same situation around the world, right? Now this was, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is something that, you know, you can read, read about. But then as we got through the pandemic, I started to have, uh, a, you know, not, not a different perspective, but an additional perspective. And, and this actually leads into really nicely this discussion of value and ROI, which you all wanted to talk about. And, and that's this video, which I think I released this in December or so on my YouTube channel, which is this idea of like, what do your customers value now? And the narrative kind of sounded something like this, right? So, so a year ago, let's say now, you know, it's more than a year ago, let's say 14 months ago, like you were in, let's say you're in North America, like I am, and it's January, February, 2020. And let's say you work for a hospital and your job was to buy personal protective equipment, right? So the question is like, what are the things that you value? What do you care about? Well, you probably care about price is probably important. 
And, uh, you know, delivery is probably like, you know, important-ish, quality is important-ish, but really like, you know, price, right? We hadn't yet thought about stockpiling PPE. Now, fast forward six months later, what is important to that buyer? All of a sudden that buyer values not price. It doesn't matter how much it costs. I don't have it. I need it here yesterday, right? And so this idea of like the thing that I valued, and by the way, the quality has to be way better than what it was six months ago, right? And so the things that I value have changed. And so the idea is, as we think about the pandemic, what has changed in terms of buying behaviors and values and so on? Well, we all think about different things as they relate to our business. So at the beginning of the pandemic, if you were in hospitality or travel tourism, your goal was just to survive, right? You had to just survive. And, and now, you know, kind of as the damage has been done, people are trying to think, okay, how do I rebound? If I was selling, a, you know, a, a piece of technology, I have most of my clients are B2B technology, um, you know, customers, they're, they're vendors. And they saw a massive migration to the cloud in even in, in traditional areas like accounting, or even I have a, one of my clients uh, builds uh, software for car dealerships to allow them to sell cars online. And all of a sudden, they had a huge uptake in, the, in their business because people were realizing, oh, you know what, even though people aren't coming into car dealerships anymore and, uh, and my car sales are slumping, you know what I value? I need, to, I need to rebound out of this. So they started seeing a lot of pickup. So this question of like, what is your buyer value and how has it changed is actually really, really important. And if I can kind of just dovetail a second here into this question about like, well, how do I get a customer to open up? This was another question someone asked. They said, I love this concept of value an ROI. Yes, there's a business benefit to doing, to investing in your product or service, but there's also like a feeling, right? A feeling. So if I'm like a CEO and I'm trying to figure out, should I invest in this financial services software? You know, there could be an element of, yes, investing in that software has a return on investment, but it's more than that. Because if I don't invest in this product or service, my company could go bankrupt right? Especially now with everything that's going on. And that has a visceral feeling to me. Like there's a, a value-based feeling there. And so value and ROI, I, I'd say this is the thing I almost, I love talking about the most because it's the thing that, that especially sales leaders are guilty of where we go and we, we tell our, 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 our sales reps, we say, go out there and we say, sell value, sell value. And when we say sell value, what, we, what we're almost saying is like, we're saying, sell the return on investment. Tell the customer that if they spend money with us, they will either save more money than that or make more money than that in return. But there are other considerations. For example, let's say I'm selling IT security software, right? And I'm selling it to a company that, uh, that, that needs to increase their you know, security of their infrastructure. There's probably a return on investment for that. You know, the cost of a data breach is so much, the cost of the reputational damage is so much, but maybe the person I'm selling to was the one on guard on the IT front when the customer experienced a data breach just a month ago. And now that person is worried that they're gonna lose their job if this happens again, right? So what do they value? Certainly they value the, 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 the return on investment, they, but they value keeping their job. They value having their company stay afloat. So this idea of value, value and ROI, very important. The problem is oftentimes we get almost like pigeonholed into thinking that our product or service has a, a very specific value proposition or ROI when in fact there are many. And I'll give you like a, I'll, I'll give you two really um, interesting examples. So, so let's, for example, assume that my primary product, the thing that I sell at Cerebral Selling is sales training, okay? Why do companies invest in sales training? If I'm trying to sell to a CEO or a VP of sales, why would that person invest in sales training? Well, oftentimes what they would look for from an ROI perspective is a metric to change. So I'm gonna teach your team how to do better discovery and better messaging and better objection handling. And as a result, you will see an uptick in the conversion rate of you know, your customers and moving from prospects to signed customers or maybe increased deal size and so on. But what's interesting is that there's other non ROI or harder to quantify ROI things that people value for why they invest in sales training. For example, maybe your company has never invested in sales training and your, your sales reps are about to walk out the door to go to a better company because that company invests in them, right? And they have that feeling. 
right? So how do you quantify that? Well, we can quantify it in terms of turnover and so on, but no one's necessarily looking at that. I'll tell you, I also get brought into companies, especially now during the pandemic, when you have all sorts of reps, they're working from home, they're lacking engagement, they're just on Zoom all the time, and they need something different. And I'm that something different for the company, right? They're spending money on me to bring some, hopefully some fun and excitement uh, and education to their reps. And what's the ROI of that? They're prob you probably would agree there is an ROI, but it's more discretionary value, right? It's a feeling. I also get brought into companies where they've done sales training with another sales trainer, maybe a year ago, that they hated. And now the VP of sales is a little bit gun shy about like, are people gonna like this? Because if they don't like this, then it's gonna reflect poorly on me. And I'm, when next time I go to my CFO asking for money, they're not gonna give me any. So all of these things come into this sphere of value. I'll tell you, fresh in my mind, I was working, so I said most of my clients are B2B technology companies, but I do have a number of com companies, clients that are outside that sphere. And one which I've been working with over the last little while is a high-end pet food company, right? They sell dog and cat food, right, to, to retailers, right? So it's a little bit different. And so what's the mission of their company? Well, the mission of their company, they sell organic, high-end, ethically sourced, traceable, really good pet food. And it's easy for their sales reps to get behind that and evangelize that to their customers, right? They get really, really excited. But now they're going to talk to a store manager, right? At a pet food store. And they're trying to sell it to that person. If they just lead with the mission of, oh yes, you know, it's organic and ethically sourced and all this kind of stuff, that, so what's the problem? That has stopped working. That has stopped working. And, and why? It's not that it's not a good mission or it's not a good mission of the company or it's not a, a, a you know, a valuable source of, of you know, a, of experience and, and, and um, discretionary value, but that's not what the person at the store, the store manager cares about in its entirety, right? What do they care about? A lot of them care about bringing customers back into the store. Customers have stopped coming into the store now. So I'm, I'm dovetailing this back with, uh, you know, with what's changed in the pandemic. People don't want to come into the, the store anymore. How do we get them back into the store? Would you be interested to know that a lot of these store managers get compensated based on um, uh, profit margin? So selling a more expensive dog food is actually better for them. And the fact that it's like, oh, it's ethically sourced and organic, like who gives a shit? And I'll, like I say that, you know, I say that, uh, you know, uh, euphemistically. But the idea here is that when we're selling to our customers and we want to get them to open up about the pains that they're experiencing and get to the real pain, sometimes we have to present them with this menu of options, right? The menu of, of feelings and ROI statements, value statements. So for example, if I was selling that pet food, okay, I would go into the store and I say, hey, look, I work for such and such pet food company. And look, I mean, look, obviously the great thing is it's organic, it's ethically sourced, all these good things. But I'll tell you, I've been working with a lot of store managers now, especially during the pandemic. And one of the things that they tell me is that they're really concerned about bringing customers back into the store and profit margin, right? Because that's how they're compensated. And then look, in all fairness, the good news is you can have it all. You can you can have that business outcome, that profit margin, that that uh, bringing customers back into the store and do it all with a pet food that is organic and ethically sourced and all these good things, right? So it's not just necessarily one thing, just like if I'm trying to sell sales training, it's not just the conversion rate or increase in conversion rate of a metric you're gonna get. At the same time, you're also gonna get people engaged. They're gonna stay longer at your company. They're gonna be you know, more engaged at work. And it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a program that people are gonna love. So it's gonna reflect really well on you too. And I can present all of these options, right? Is that both the, the hardcore ROI and the discretionary value statements, right? To get people excited about the value that I can add. So I wanted to kind of hit those two things, the pandemic, as well as kind of this value ROI. How do we get people to open up? But it's being attuned. Like you can't, for example, part of the challenge that exists, I'll give you like an example, this pet food company is that people join the company because they love what the, the mission of the company ethically sourced pet foods, it's organic, it's, it's, great for, it's great for the animals, right? And that's why they join. But that doesn't mean that's why people are buying it, right? But they can, you can still have it all. You can, you can still uh, you know, achieve the mission of the company, right? It's like you might buy my book for all sorts of reasons. It doesn't matter what the reason is. It still achieves my objective of, of getting the message out there.
Any questions about that before we move on to the next, the next topic? Feel free. And by the way, you can. I have the Zoom chat open, so you can feel free to, to, uh, to say something in the Zoom chat. And if you just joined, welcome. Feel free to uh, to pop in and uh, and say where you're where you're dialing in from today. All right. So this is an interesting question. So this is again another popular question that came in about well, what's my favorite sales tactic? You know, which strategy have I seen have the biggest impact. And yes, Luke, this is being recorded. So I'm happy to send out the recording afterwards if everyone wants to, uh, to take a look. All right. Yes. Very exciting. All right. Hey, Matt from Boston. Good to see you. And Jonathan from the UK. Good to see you too. So this question was like, what's been the most impactful sales tactic? And this is like, it's a hard thing to answer. It's like, you know, who's my favorite child? I might have a favorite child, but uh, you know, but I love them all for, <laughs> for different reasons. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll share two of my kind of favorite, I guess, strategies. One, the most impactful sales tactic is actually not so much a tactic at all as it is uh, what I talk about in chapter four of the book, which is the idea that the experience is the product, right? The experience is the product. And I'll tell you, there are sales reps that I've known that I've heard stories of that represent amazing class leading products, right? Gartner Magic Quadrant, you know, uh, it's, it's the go-to default solution. And yet, customers don't choose them because they don't like the rep. The rep created a shitty experience during the buying process. They were arrogant. They didn't call them back on time. Like just basic things they could have done better tainted the customer experience. And it's the same thing. You could go to a retail store, right? The store sells, uh, you know, electronics and it's wonderful, but you get someone who's rude to you. The bathroom at the store is dirty. This is actually something back in my workforce management days first company I worked for was a company called Workbrain. And we would do enterprise workforce management at, you know, big retailers, banks, airlines, and so on. And, you know, you go into a Walmart, for example, you go into a store and the bathroom is dirty. You're not coming back in that store, even, you know, even for the products, right? This was like a real thing in the retail industry. So the experience is the product, right? And so you can have a lesser product, you know, uh, objectively speaking, it doesn't do as much as the competitor. It's not as far along. It might even be more expensive. And yet if you can create that amazing frictionless, you know, high in, in you know, kind of uh, uh, attentiveness feeling to the customer, they'll buy from you, right? And I've had lots of clients that have said, you know, over the years have said they have bought from me just because they said, oh, you know what? I, I just enjoyed working with you, right? And so that, in that sense, all of the tactics that we talked about in the book and I, you know, I talk about in my content can help you create that great experience for the customer. But if I had to kind of pick, you know, one tactic tactic that we talked about in the book that I, I've seen have a big impact, it would be the one that I talk about around reciprocity, right? Reciprocity, adding value to our customers, right? Like we give, it's almost like, you know, you think about uh, in sales, we like to make withdrawals from the bank. You know, we like to ask our customers for things, send us this. We want you to get on a call with us. We want access to your company. We want information. And so the biggest thing we can do is make deposits in that account. And there's lots of, and the good thing is there's lots of ways that we can make deposits in that account. Sometimes people think about it and someone actually asked uh, in the questions leading up to this, they said, you know, other than like gifts, like gifts and white papers and books, you know, like what are some of the things that we can do to, to drive reciprocity? And there's lots of gifts that you can give that aren't associated with, uh, you know, uh, like, a, like an article or an, an item of interest, right? Like we think about, oh, we give, you know, uh, uh, you know um, uh, bookmarks and, and books and, uh, and free white papers and things like that. I would also say you have to be careful when it comes to reciprocity. If you start giving things that are, for example, from your website, oh, I'm gonna give someone a white paper that links back to my website. That can sometimes be seen as, you know, slightly uh, self-serving. But I'll tell you, I mean, there's lots of things you can do. And, you know, starting from the very, very simple, which I, I don't have the article here because uh, I just didn't include the slide, but it is a, a recent pandemic article that you can uh, catch on my blog. Um, it's called Do Your Homework. Three reasons why science says doing your research before you reach out to the prospect can increase your close rates or something like that. It's do your homework, right? And the idea is that oftentimes in sales, we reach out to customers and prospects without doing our homework. We reach out with like a generic pitch. We reach out with like a, oh, you know, I've heard that people like you like want this, right? Or 
um, or they're, or you're factually incorrect in your outreach, which is what I've seen a ton of. People reach out to me all the time. They want to sell me stuff. And I've seen things that are factually incorrect. They reach out to me and they say, hey, David, I know you run a call center for, uh, you know, uh, accounting recruiting or whatever it is. I'm like, that's ridiculous. You know, someone went down this whole road with me. You know, you, you probably you do probably do a lot of CNC plasma cutting in your business. And uh, so, you know, supplier reputation is really important for you. Who do you use today? And I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin, right? So even something simple like doing your homework, listening, these are all important ways that you can generate reciprocity, right? Someone, someone uh, you know, now feels slightly more indebted to you. I will tell you, this is actually a, um, I don't think I wrote about this in the book. This is a blog post waiting to happen. You want to know the most, the, the most impactful, highest ROI sales tactic that we used at Salesforce in my business unit. Now, the, the thing was with me, I was a, um, I was a, uh, uh, a Salesforce customer a few times. Um, and so now, a, a Salesforce small business customer, mind you, now I'm running small business sales for the Eastern US at Salesforce. And I'm now serving the customers like I was. And I felt like everything that we did was good at Salesforce, but there was always like a thinly veiled product pitch in the end, you know, like, oh, come learn about the future of this. And then like the punchline is like, we're, and we're trying to sell you something at the end. So one of the things that we started to do is we started to run these dinners, these executive dinners, and we would go to different cities. And in my segment, I was the US East Coast, different cities in our segment. And we would go to like, you know, the hub cities like New York, Atlanta, you know, those kind of cities. But then we would go to like the secondary markets you know, the Pittsburghs, the Cincinnati's, these are great markets, great clients and places where we didn't have an office. And we would go and, I, and we would do these executive dinners and all we would do, we would get 10 to 20 of our customer CEOs at the dinner. And I made it important for my reps, if you're gonna recruit executives for these dinners, have them be C-level executives, right? So that the consistency of the role is important. And we bought them a copy of one of my favorite books, I, I think I referenced it in my book, the, it's called The One Thing, The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. And this book is all about prioritization, it's all about focus, and something that of course, a lot of executives and CEOs struggle with. So we would go to these dinners, and what we would do is we'd give them a copy of the book, and we would have these quiet dinners where we would get together, and, and when I say quiet, I mean, we did some networking and you know have a beer and stuff like that at the beginning, but then we would all sit down, and then everyone would shut up, and we would go around the table and people would introduce themselves and they would talk about what their one thing is. Like what's the one thing such that if they did it in their business, everything else would be easier or unnecessary. And, and people would say what their one thing was, give a little bit of context for their business. Other people would chime in. And we went through the whole dinner like that, two, three hours of dinner, every course, quiet, listening to each other, offering advice. We didn't ask for anything in the end, there was no product pitch. In fact, we told people at the beginning, we don't want to talk about Salesforce. That's not why we're here. We're here for you. You know, we love connecting with customers in our, our space and helping where we can. And what happened was they left. They found those events so valuable that what happened afterwards is that now when our reps called them, it's the end of the month. Now we need a signature on the contract at the end of the month. They took our call, right? They hustled a little bit more for us. We had formed that relationship with them. We added value. That, and by the way, we measure everything at Salesforce. Those events were the highest ROI events that we had in our entire segment, including Dreamforce. When you think about the revenue that comes in and then the 90 days following that event, highest ROI event we had, comes back to this principle of reciprocity. Find ways of adding value, sometimes even unexpected value, right? So I have a video on my YouTube channel. Again, this is a recent video since the summertime. So if you just look chronologically, you'll see it. And it talks about different gifts that we can give our customers. And I would say creating, and that, but this is part and parcel of creating that great experience. We, we talked about the experience as the product. How do you create that great experience? One of the most impactful ways is this principle of reciprocity. We give things without asking for anything in return, right? And that's what builds the affinity. That's what builds a relationship. As soon as it's funny, I, I, we used to do uh, you know tr sales training back at Salesforce. I remember the trainer said something that was um, I always remember. He said, you know, when you're in sales, and this is this is my words. I'll say when you're in sales, you're the enemy. Okay, no one wants to talk to you. You're you're the enemy. And so 
uh, you have to work extra hard to show your customers that you're different, right? Because they're already going into it thinking that you're the enemy and you're bad and you're evil. And what happens is you kind of, it's almost like an equestrian event, you know, horse, horse riding, where you're kind of going through the course and you're jumping the gates and like it's going so far, it's going good so far. But then all it takes, so this is the trainer asked, he said, how much, so they're going through the, you're going through the sales process and the customer's thinking, oh, like, uh, you know, Joyce, she's, she's treating me really nicely. She hasn't asked for anything. She's, she's not sleazy. She doesn't remind me of some of those bad salespeople, right? Things are going good. And then the question was, how much of that stereotypical old school pushy sales behavior do you think it's going to take to push that customer over the edge, right? The answer, very little, very little. Just one trip up and you're just like everyone else, right? And so it's really important to preserve that sentiment of just giving back as much as you can during the process. Now, of course, you know, giving back allows you to ask for things. And I'm not saying you should be a pushover, right? There's a, you know, you should absolutely stand up for yourself, but that reciprocity is just so, so powerful in so many different areas of life. So I would say, create a great experience, invoking reciprocity as much as you can. The data is on the side, exper the experience is on the side. Uh, so that's what I would say. Now, next question that came in, the question about, well, what's the biggest need? Someone said, you know, in, in terms of your practice, you work with all these companies, where do you see sellers need the most help? Um, and then especially as it relates to attracting new customers. This was an, another thing someone added. And, you know, I'll tell you, so I work also with a lot of um, uh, tech accelerators here in Toronto where I live. So these are companies that are often started by technical founders, engineers who had this idea for a great product and they come up with this great product and uh, then they, they kind of go to market with it. And then they're one, they wonder why no one is lining up to buy this thing. And the biggest need that I found is, is the simplest thing. And this is actually why I started, you know, in chapter five of the book, uh, High Impact Messaging, which is just describing what you do. What do you, like when I say, you know, what do you do, Keith? What do you do, right? Like, what do you say? Because how you answer that question is really, really important, right? Because people are distracted. There's a million people that do what you do. There's a million people that do what I do, okay? We're not such delicate, unique snowflake flowers here that like there's no one else in the world that can do what we do. So we have to lead with a message which is powerful and differentiated. And especially when you get people who found companies, they're technical founders, they have a great product. They just can't explain to someone else what the hell the product does. And I'll tell you, the other problem is that this, not getting this right, is, uh, is the thing that produces so many downstream problems. So I'd say like, I get tons of companies coming to me saying, hey, David, we need negotiation training. If you notice, negotiation was a, uh, a chapter I left out of the book. Um, I actually do teach negotiation, but the, the book was already too long. And so, so I couldn't include more. But people say, hey, David, we need negotiation training. And I say, well, why do you think you need negotiation training? And they say, well, we're giving away 30% discounts, 25% discounts. We're super inconsistent. We're letting, we're letting vendors like push us around. And then you said, well, like, well, why is that? Like, why do you have to give a 30% discount? Now, look, I'm not above saying, you know, sometimes it's a systemic problem, meaning maybe your pricing model is just messed up because that happens from time to time, right? But oftentimes it's because we didn't describe our value and going back to this question of value versus ROI, I'll go back to this, right? This idea of value versus ROI, we didn't get customers to really open up about their pain. We didn't really figure out what problem we were trying to help them solve. And so then when we get into like discovery, we get into objection handling, we get into negotiation, we're just lost, right? And then we have to use like discounting and all these kind of downstream tactics as a way of, of basically saving uh, uh, the deal. So. I would say the biggest, and, and by the way, describing what you do in the context of all of the things that we talked about in the book, describing what you do is the upfront piece. Like that's why, you know, we talk about it in chapter five. It's one of the easiest things to do. Discovery, you know, in all fairness is hard. Like getting discovery to sound and look natural is hard. And actually, you know, we were kind of talking about this at the beginning with uh, Arvind who joined from India here. You know, I was saying, you know, one of the, the biggest uh, challenges 
is taking these tactics and incorporating them in a way that feels natural, but more importantly, and here's this, this word I use all the time, sales tactics should feel undetectable. They should feel undetectable. The customer should not feel like you're using a tactic on them, that you are reading from a script because buyers can tell immediately when you're reading from a script. I talk about this all the time, even as it relates to my own children. I got three, three girls, you know, I talk about in the book. When they come up to me and they're about to hit me up for something, I can tell immediately, right? Just by the way they approach me. And your customers can tell as well, if you're executing a tactic, which you intrinsically believe is, is low value, is schlocky, it sounds like you're reading from a pitch, you know, from a pitch deck, marketing words, right? Then they will not give you the time of day. And so really nailing that upfront part, describing what you do and have it feel very natural and undetectable, super important. So I'd say like, that's the biggest need where, you know, if you ask me like, what's one thing, focus on describing what you do really well. We've got a couple more and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll open it up to all of you. And again, these were, these were the questions that you asked, right? These were like the number, the number, the top six questions that out of the hundreds that came in uh, that you asked. So this was an, I, I, I found this was an interesting one. And the answer to this one might surprise you. So the question was like, what about old school sellers? You know, and, and I, I sense where this is coming from is that you're on this call and you love the book because you like this idea of adopting like a new way of doing things. And I'd say like new, this isn't really new. It's just, it's, it's more, it's, it's more uh, scientifically proven. It's more human and it feels new because for many years, salespeople didn't operate like this. And so you're saying to yourself, Hey, look, I want more people in my company to, to do this kind of stuff. How, how do I get, how do I convert people? How do I get people who have relied on doing things for a certain amount of time and get them to adopt these new things? And the first thing I would say is that maybe you shouldn't, right? Maybe you shouldn't. And, and kind of what I'm, and I say this for two reasons. Number one, um, I am one of the, the fan, and this is actually in, you know, it's chapter eight. I, I don't want to say it's chapter eight of the book. Uh, when I was writing the book, I was thinking I should have like a concluding chapter, right? A con like chapter eight after objection, there should be a concluding chapter. And, uh, and I was just kind of like, I went to my publisher and I said, I don't, I don't want to make my readers read a useless chapter that's just a summary, right? They already got the gist of the book. Uh, I don't want to have to create more words. And they said, absolutely, that is the right mindset to be in because they said typically in business books, the last chapter is a throwaway where there's not really anything new. It's just a bit, a bit of a summary. So they said, instead of writing a big chapter, just write like a few pages, put a bow on everything, right? So that's what I did. I think I, it's called like the afterword. It's not really called chapter eight. And one of the things I talk about in, in that afterward is don't fall in love with your sales tactics, right? Don't fall in love. And so what I mean by that is if you have someone in your organization who is uh, older school and they, they use tactics that, um, that you wouldn't use today, uh, my question to you is that maybe you shouldn't change them. Maybe, maybe the tactics that they're using are working for them, if they're working for them. And by the way, you know, I say a lot of these, these tactics that we talk about now in the realm of modern selling apply to modern buyers, right? This idea that buyers, just like sellers are getting younger, they don't think the same way as older school sellers and buyers do. But if you're in an industry where you're selling to older school buyers who are used to these tactics and don't mind these tactics, it's almost like, you know, I, we, we talked about it, my third startup, which I talk about in the book, Ripple, which was a, a modern feedback coaching and recognition platform. And, you know, we, we would go to companies and we would say, hey, look, do you hate performance reviews? And they would say, yeah, hell yeah, we hate performance reviews. But from time to time, you know, you would get someone, it's funny, I remember, so my father-in-law, who's well into his 70s, you know, when we were doing our, uh, our, the startup, he said, oh, like, I don't mind performance reviews. I, you know, once a year review, like, tell me how I'm doing, give me a rank, a grade, a score. That's fine with me. Right. And, and so trying to convince someone like that, that, oh, they should change their ways. Not only is it, will it not work, it's not necessary. They like it. So I would say, if you're trying to convert an old school seller who's using older school tactics and those tactics are working, then you're not going to have a lot of success trying to change their mind. Where you will have more success is if you have an organization or sellers who are trying to execute with old outdated tactics and, uh, and those tactics aren't working anymore. 
right? Like if, you're, if your tactics are working, we should do what you're doing. But if they're not working, if your conversion rates aren't as good as people who are adopting these new tactics, well, maybe that should be the catalyst to change, right? This actually kind of goes back to tactic number five in the objection handling chapter, which is, uh, uh, you know, because uh, I, I think I call it something different in my, in my practice. Uh, I, re I refer to it as, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's like, well, now, oh my gosh, now the, the word is escaping me, um, where it's like, well, maybe we should just keep doing what you're doing, right? Like, maybe this doesn't make sense. Maybe, you know, maybe you shouldn't switch to us, right? And so the idea here is that you want them to come to you, right? I, in my training, I'll call this consider the alternative, right? Maybe, maybe you shouldn't change. Maybe you shouldn't change, right? And then ask them, like, what would you do instead? Consider the alternative, right? What would you do instead? If you kept using these old school sales tactics, what would happen, right? And get them to see either yes or no that they'd be better off changing. It's always better to change people from the inside out, right? Than tell them they shouldn't do this. Now, look, at the same time, I will say, back at Salesforce, we would get questions from clients who would say, hey, look, we've made this big investment in your technology and your software, and it's really, really great. And there's some people that aren't adopting it. What, what do we do? Like, how do we get them on side? And are there things you can do to get them on side? Yes, you can get, you know, some of the early adopters to show them the value and talk about how, the, why the experience is so great and all this kind of stuff. But at a certain point, you just have to say, it's your job to do this. And if you're not doing this, then you're not doing your job. And I, I can't teach you how to just, you know, how to, how to change your mind and, and see this as something that, that we are doing organizationally, culturally, because it's more effective. So anyways, those are kind of my, my thoughts here on, uh, on how to convert old school sellers. And the last question I'll, I'll, I'll say to kind of, you know, before we're opening it up, uh, again, your last question around, like, how do we put these tactics to work? Like, what's the best way to operationalize these tactics? my team and my company and, and just make them feel natural, right? And my advice, just like anything else, if you wanna learn any other tactic is uh, start small, right? You don't have to do everything all at once, pick one thing, right? Back to the one thing, pick one thing that you're gonna do every day, every week and just stick with that one thing, like for a few weeks, right? Until it feels natural. I'll tell you this question around, how do you make things sound conversational and not scripted? So the first step oftentimes is to write it out. It's kind of counterintuitive. Like we have to script it out just so that we kind of have the words and the, and the tactics in our heads. But my advice to you, um, as I do this with my clients and we, we start thinking about, okay, well, what should, the, what should the words be? Try to use normal, natural words that human beings use with one another, right? Don't go out and start using fancy marketing words. And, and as you say them, you know, the, you think to yourself, oh yeah, this is something I would see like on a website somewhere, right? Like use words that sound conversational, start with one tactic and just practice, practice, practice. We actually at Salesforce, again, we certify people in our messaging. You know, we would kind of say, here's the first call deck, here's the messaging. And, and we would say, practice, practice, practice. We would record them and we would, we would just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until it sounded conversational. Like think about something that you do or love in your life, right? A hobby, a passion that you have, a cause you support. If I asked you to talk about that thing, I wouldn't hear marketing lingo. I would hear like passion and conviction coming from you personally, right? That's the way you have to get your sales tactics ingrained into your mindset, right? It just has to sound normal. And, you know, I, one of the easiest ways, if I can tie this all together, we talked about how messaging, right? Describing what you do is really important. The first messaging tactic I talk about in the book, polarization, right? Love, hate. Start with that, right? People love feedback. They hate performance reviews, right? I, I say all the time, let me look, people love to buy stuff. They hate talking to salespeople, right? Now you don't even know what I do, assuming that you didn't know what I did, right? Is when you use words, colloquial words, regular words, love, hate, you know, uh, the way you would describe your favorite kind of music or the way you describe your, your favorite passion or hobby, do the same thing to describe what you do and just focus on one thing at a time. That is my best advice. So you read a book and I'll tell you like the same thing. I, I love all of the books that I referenced in mine, uh, but every book that I read, you know, people love Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference or, you know, The One Thing or Essentialism or Dan Pink's To Sell as Human. I don't remember everything from those books. There's like a few tactics that are that still resonate in my head. 
And so I would say, if you, and, and, and the funny thing is for all of you, it'll all be different. So I'd say from my book, if you can just take a few tactics that resonated the most in your head, put those to practice, right? Just keep iterating and iterating. And then a few months down the road, read the book again, right? Come back, pick something new up, right? I don't know, everyone's different in terms of how they read books. If they're, you know, you're more meticulous, if you're, you're taking notes, if you have the audio book, you wanna come back to a certain section. But um, no, look, it's like anything else. You wanna get better at a sport, a hobby, uh, you know, going to the gym, anything you need, uh, just focus on one, one little thing at a time. That's it. Now, look, I there's a whole bunch of other questions that people ask, but I wanna open it up. There's, there's not fancy here, we're on a Zoom. You can unmute yourself, go nuts. Ask whatever you like. I see here, Dominic, you're asking, what's my take on the intricate, too many people in the decision vendor selection process? You know, it's interesting because uh, in a way, the vendor selection, so if you're talking about like enterprise sales where you have like different stakeholders and multiple different stakeholders, what that can sometimes serve to do is it can defray some of the emotional value, right? Like some person, let's say in that selection committee might lose their job if this project fails. But, you know, there's six other people who don't, are not fearful of their jobs, right? And so it's sometimes hard to kind of balance that out and figure out, okay, like how am I gonna get this to move? Because not everyone cares about the same thing. When you start getting into that uh, more enterprise level decision and selection process, and this is actually my first company for eight years, this is all we did. Um, it be, it's actually a, a much more difficult skill. It's a different skill set. Enterprise selling is a different skill set than selling to just you know small small team of people. And the, the kind of the process you have to go through is you have to map it out, right? You have to map out who are these people? Who are the eight people involved in the selection process? And what is their preference for us? And what is their power in the organization? And who do they report to? Like, it's actually a skill that, you know, when you think about growing as a salesperson and you start out as like, a let's say a BDR, SDR, and you grow up and you have, you know, small business and, you know, mid-market enterprise selling. Enterprise selling to me is not a natural extension of kind of that trajectory. It is a different skill set. And I found that the best sellers overall were the ones uh, that were the best at kind of mapping out that organization and figuring out who to, you know, some, uh, one of the enterprise sales reps I used to work with used to call them the foxes. Like, which fox do I need to get to? Who's going to kind of be the one that's going to kind of bust this thing open? What's the power dynamic look like? So I would say, I mean, it was not, it's not a quick answer, Dominic, but this idea of really mapping out the organization, figuring out who's in charge, who has the preference, who has the sway. Um, and in fact, so much of that actually just kind of transcends the product and what you do. It's a, like I said, it's a completely different skill set. So I'd say like, that's my first piece of advice. Um, Mark, you're asking like any tips for engaging prospects uh, and getting them excited in the middle stage of a long sales cycle. Sometimes it's, you know, one year plus. And it's interesting, you know, I am, uh, <laughs> no problem, Dominic. Um, one of the things that I, I think about so I'm, I'm a fan and student of all different kinds of sales. And there's a fellow that I don't follow, but pops up every now and then in my uh, YouTube feed. And this is a fellow that he trains uh, car salespeople. And again, we're not selling cars here, although you know we could be. And I don't agree with all the, the tactics he brings out because still buying a car nowadays is still, unless you're buying like a Tesla, you're plunking down your credit card, is still a bit of an old school uh, process. And so uh, one of the things that he says, he says, you know, here's how, here's how car salespeople are typically instructed to get referrals. So they wait until they sell you a car. And at the end of the, the uh, experience, they say, Jim, did you have a good experience buying the car for me? You enjoying your car? Like everything is good. And Jim says, oh yeah, no, it's good. And then I say, Jim, do you have any friends or family who, uh, you know, who uh, you think would be interested in buying a car? You know, maybe send them my way. And Jim's like, all right, yeah, sure, whatever, right? Now it's like six months later and Jim's driving his car and he's having a good old time. And someone says, uh, oh yeah, you know what? I, I probably could, could use a car. You know anyone, Jim? And Jim hasn't had contact with his salesperson in quite some time, right? And so he's not top of mind. The one thing that I like that this car sales trainer said was he said like, that's the, that's the slow road to victory, asking people for referrals at the end of the sales cycle. He said, you know what I do? It's like, I stay in their life. I stay in their life. 
I send them birthday cards. I check in with them from time to time. I, I share insights about their car that maybe they didn't know. You know, and now look, getting the right balance of, you know, not something that's schlocky or low value, doesn't feel like you're kind of a, you know, a, a deadbeat parent trying to get back into the relationship. All that's important, but he's like, but I stay in their life. And then the next time someone in their, in their life needs a car, who would they think of? They think of me because I am just in their life. So my advice, back to you, Mark, my advice to you, when you're engaged in a long sales cycle, you would have to, I, I want you to think of it in terms of like, how do I stay in this person's life? Because if they say, oh yeah, like we're not gonna make a decision for six months and then you're like, okay, great. Let's touch base in six months. Like the whole world can change in six months, right? So if this is a customer that is important to you that you wanna stay, you know, kind of uh, top of mind with, then make sure, they, make sure that you're making the effort that you continue to be top of mind by adding value, sending them you know, valuable resources. It can't just be the, oh, it's David just checking in. You know, how, how's it going here today? You know, you wanna buy something now, right? And, and it's very easy. I actually talk about different ways of adding value back to this concept of reciprocity in my, um, uh, in my video that I mentioned earlier in the talk uh, that you can find most recently on my YouTube channel. I think it's probably one of the last five ones of different ways of adding gifts, adding value. But my, my best advice is just stay in their life, stay top of mind. And, and look, you know, in, in my business, I love writing. I love creating the videos. I love putting out content. Um, you know, and, and that's the way, like, I don't do any marketing. I don't buy any, I don't buy any ads anywhere. All I do is I have my book, I have my clients, I have my social channels, my blog, I give everything away for free. I don't charge for any of all that stuff. Just, you know, and it's not, and I do that because it's my mission, but it also helps just keep me top of mind, top of mind for people, right? So I would say like, that's my best piece of advice. Just stay top of mind, not just checking in, right? Actual adding value, stay in their life, Luke. I'm glad you liked it. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. So after you identify the pain points, what kind of questions do you get? Uh, how, what kind of, kind of questions do you get them to be emotional about the pain point? Are you, are you asking, uh, like, if I'm, if I'm just listing, you know, if after I identify the pain, how do I, how do I pull out the emotion? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's lots of different ways. There's lots of different ways, you know, and this goes back to some of the discovery tactics I talk about in the book. So when someone talks about their pain, you know, like, oh, you know, I've been, uh, we've had, we've struggled with this issue. And you can start asking those basic layered questions, right? Like, well, how long has it been going on? And why do you think, again, the questions that people love answering are the opinion-based questions. So rather than bombarding them with fact-based, how long has it been going on? And, you know, who cares? And, um, you know, uh, how does that work, right? Like, why do you think it's been going on for so long? Right? Like get them to like start pulling back the layers and, and, you know, what have you done to solve it? And, and did that work? And like, why didn't it work? Right. And then you can also kind of take a step back and say like, you know, so, and so for example, if what you're hearing is not emotional, right. If you're hearing uh, things that are like, well, you know, it'd be good to solve this, good to solve that. You know, sometimes I think in the back of my head, okay, I'm selling a product or service. At some point, I'm going to ask you to write a check. I don't know if anyone writes checks anymore, but at some point I'm going to ask you for money in exchange for what I'm selling here. And I'm trying to figure out, are you going to pay me that money? Like, is this problem big enough for us to solve? Right? Like, and I might, if I find that you're kind of too far away, I might say, you know, um, can, can I just ask, like, how, how big a problem do you think this is? Because I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, is this even worth it for you to solve with me? And you can start asking these questions that are going to get them to kind of go down deeper, right? Into this a layer of emotion. That's one way. The other way, if they're more guarded, and by the way, a lot of you said, you know, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I've been very, you know, sometimes I work with clients who are very guarded, very prospects are very guarded, they don't want to tell me anything. Sometimes the way you get them to open up is with a tactic I call assumptive priming. And I, I talk about this in the book, I refer to it as labeling, which is you bring the pain to them, right? You bring the pain to them. And the beauty of bringing the pain to them is that not only will it help them you know, uh, identify with the emotion that you're bringing, but sometimes they haven't even thought of these things, right? Like if I'm trying to sell sales training to someone and they're saying, yeah, we need sales training because you know, our conversion rate for you know, of our clients is very low and we need to be doing better. 
So I might say, oh, you know, look, I can help you with that. I'll tell you though, it's interesting when I work with lots of people, you know, sales leaders like you who are looking to do sales training, part of it is they're looking to see a, you know, a movement in the metric. And then part of it is just overall employee engagement, right? The team is working from home. It's hard to engage them. They're trying to figure out like, am I getting the best out of my team members? I don't have the incidental hallway conversations that I used to, you know, and, and actually the data says now people are leaving companies, the people are leaving companies, like depart employee departures, like not, you know, voluntary departures, not you're getting fired, but are, are at, a, at a, a big time high now because people are taking the pandemic as an opportunity to recalibrate and do all these things. And so again, I'm just, I'm just bringing this as an example to the question of like, how do I pull out the pain? Once I start volunteering some of these pains, and especially if they are in the unknown unspoken category, as I talk about in the book, that will more deeply resonate with your customer because maybe those are, oh, those, those, are, those are pains that are deep down inside that they have not reconciled yet and that they hadn't even thought were major pains until you brought them up. So you can do a lot of good, I'd say in the sales cycle by using some of these labeling tactics. Um, you know, again, this goes back to like, the, again, the value and ROI that we talked about at the beginning of the session it's not just that the dog food is, you know, organic and good for good for your animal, but um, uh, it will help you increase your profit margin, and it'll bring people back into the store that that weren't there before. Labeling things and you know, kind of uh, uh, bringing out some of these pains that they weren't thinking about is a great way for them to get deeper in touch with the emotional element. So, anyways, that was uh, so. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, those are really great questions. Uh, I do still do meetups in Toronto. We can, we can, we can chat uh, uh, offline. And by the way, if any of you are sales leaders, um, I'll mention this. So I, the question was, do I still do meetups in Toronto? So I used to run a sales leadership meetup in Toronto. Um, and why? Well, it's because where I am, sales leadership is a really tough gig and we all need a support group and, and people to rely on. Um, there wasn't any cost associated with doing this, but since the pandemic, we've actually brought the group online. I actually have over 200 sales leaders that are part of this group. So if you're interested in being part of this group, I don't advertise it. I don't sell it. I don't push it. Um, it's called the Sales Leadership Mastermind. Hit me up and I will uh, send you an invite to it. And we typically meet once a month right now for an hour and we talk about all things sales leadership. So anyways, uh, I hope you enjoyed our session today. Quick, I know for a quick question for those of you who are um, still here, I had a question because, you know, I, I uh, want to know if there's interest in doing more of these, right? More of these. So my question to you, if you're still on the, uh, on the Zoom, would you like to do more of these? Like if we did them on a more regular basis, I don't know what the regular basis is. Maybe it's once a month. We dive into, you know, different tactics. We do some Q&A. Is this something that you would, uh, you would like to do? Okay, good. All right. Ooh, let's go. Well, if, you, if the answer was no, then, uh, you know, you might, no, this is, you know, it's anonymous, so I can't, I can't see who's saying what, but uh, so far it is 100%. <laughs> yes. So that is, uh, that is good. Uh, write, a, write another book. Well, you know, that, that was the other thing people actually, um, they asked, uh, so what's, what's next? You know, the book hasn't even been out for a year yet. So uh, hopefully I have a little bit more time before I have to write another one. There are definitely a lot of things that I was not able to include in the first one. So it could very well be a, uh, a second book in there, but, uh, but we'll have to see how that, uh, that plays out. Anyways, it was great to uh, see you all. Hey, Steph, great to see you too. Um, uh, we'll talk about it. Maybe we'll do another one of these. We'll get deeper, but look, I really appreciate it. I just want to say, I really appreciate all your time again today. Uh, I know it is uh, not insignificant to take an hour out to sit on yet another Zoom. So thank you for all of your care and attention here, everyone. And I wish you all the best in your sales journey. Keep in touch. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime.